have for us. All right. Um, click. And we're live. It is Thursday, December 9th, 2021. 5.02 p.m. We are two minutes late because a mysterious noise took over Kate's computer such that uh, uh, we couldn't uh, begin the show on time. We had to, uh, oh my God, somebody is uh, uh, joining us in David's pain. Um, uh, a, a mysterious noise was taking over the show, um, but uh, we have vanquished it. The shoe bill took out the uh, purveyor of the mysterious noise. Uh, and we are here with David Priest and... Is that John Tyler? Andrew? Uh, it is uh, some president that we managed to get rid of at some point or another. Uh, and he's not staying still long enough. Oh. Who is that? Uh, that has an Andrew Jackson-y look to him. Oh. Uh, James K. Polk. Yeah, who the fuck is going to um, guess that? Most, like, I don't even remember that he's president most days. Well, Ooh, James K. Polk. Or James K. James K. Polk had, uh, I, is sometimes, I believe, called the only president to have kept all of his campaign promises because he basically only made two and they both involved, you know, imperialism. Uh, <laughs> Going to expand us, expand us coast to coast and, you know, declare war on Mexico. Uh, and he did them both. Uh, so, you know... Bully, bully, bully for, for Mr. Polk. Um, I have a question. Wait, why do you have, before we get to anything substantive or or even trivial that's not about James K. Polk, why do you have a James K. Polk doll on your desk? You are phrasing the question incorrectly, Ben. It is not why do you have James K. Polk bobblehead. The question is, why do you not have a James K. Polk bobblehead because collecting presidential bobbleheads is a thing of, of beauty and grace. So if you don't like James K. Polk, maybe you'll like Gerald Ford with his pipe. Hmm? I have a picture of you, David, at the Gerald Ford Library uh, uh, giving a speech. Stalker. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, it's... Uh, 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 so I know you have a Gerald Ford uh fetish I do have the bobblehead yeah. you do not have a picture of me at the james k polk uh library and museum because there is not such a place. so kk you said but, you had a yes presidential bobbleheads well it kind of That's relates to bobbleheads which is just do you guys ever like have moments of kind of existent do you like feel worse or better about the fact that you're going to like one day be forgotten by almost everyone alive today but i, I, I don't, don't accept i can't I like accept list the, all the presidents i don't accept the premise of the question kate <laughs> i i do think that long after my death i do believe this from the bottom of my heart that long after my death children will be talking about me um uh while they jump rope so um uh you know, I, I, oddly specific <laughs> like legacy. That is eerily specific. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, but I'm serious. I, I actually hold on. I want to talk. Wait, do we have something we have to talk about? Because I want to talk. Well, about I do have. A, I do have a very important monologue uh, 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 about uh, 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 about being mansplained on Twitter this morning. Um, uh, uh, but uh, it can wait. Okay. Um, I was just going to say that when I was first on the job market um, for, well, when I was on, I was only on the job market one year, but when I was on the job market, I went up to Harvard to give a talk and the law school and they have this hall that is just covered. One whole wall is covered by former professors, like photographs, old photographs of like former professors in black and white, like headshots. And I was walking this hall and there's just all of these people and there's some that you know, right? Like, I think you have to get like, I don't know, you get a chair or something and then you go on the wall. Um, but I was looking through all of these like fancy people 
And it was actually amazing to me how like I have never heard of like 90% of them. And they were very fancy law professors, the pinnacle of law professordom at, at Harvard Law School, chaired professors. And I had never heard of them. And I was like, nothing matters. <laughs> that was, I know it's a strange takeaway, but like, I was like, if like no one remembers who these people are like now, then like maybe like, yeah, I don't know. Maybe, is that a weird thing to take away from your bobblehead? No, look, I, uh, I think that, you know, we are all, you know, we should all remember that we are extremely important to ourselves. Um, and some of us can maybe aspire to be really important to a small number of people around us. But at the end of the day, we are uh, insignificant clusters of matter on a small planet orbiting an insignificant star in a trivial galaxy among get me. tens of quadrillions of you, others. I'm a bobblehead. And frickin' LOL, nothing matters. All of which brings me to the tweet that I awoke to this morning at 3.50 in the morning. I had been asleep for exactly two hours. Um, and 3.50 uh, in the 3 morning? 3.50 in the morning. It Where happens you sometimes. Uh, you know, as as I sometimes joke with Lisa Page, sleep like it's 19, uh, 2017. Um, I don't know. I get up early. Um, and I woke up and I pulled over uh, my phone to look at Twitter and uh, uh, I saw a tweet from the estimable Paul Jacobson that said, at Benjamin Wittes, at Lawfare blog, Quinta Jurassic did not in any sense write for Fred, quotes. As also, Fred Hyatt allowed bad faith writers to publish disinformation on his op-ed pages, and he knew that's exactly what they were doing. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, oh, this gets pretty Byzantine and Ben's defensive of Fred. But at 3.50 in the morning, all I could do was look at this tweet and burst out laughing because I, as I tweeted myself, I felt suddenly the way all women feel when they get mansplained a subject within their expertise. Because the subject of this tweet is a subject I say that there is nobody, literally nobody in the world that knows more about than me. Um, uh, when, uh, when there are people who know more about Quinta's work for Fred than I do, like Quinta and I suppose Fred, although he being dead now, uh, um, uh, that probably he'd be off Quinta. that list. Yeah, it's well, probably just Quinta. And there are people who uh, know more about disinformation than I do, including Quinta. Um, uh, and there are people who know more about uh, op-ed page policies at the Wall Street Journal in relation to disinformation than I do i.e. the current staff of the Post editorial page, there is exactly nobody who knows more about the combined amalgam subject of Quinta and her work for Fred, their relationship, I introduced them by the way, and uh, uh, the Post's policies toward disinformation and op-ed writers than I do. And I mean fucking nobody. And here's this twerp lecturing me about this and I'm thinking, ah, me and the, uh, the poor PhD who slaved away on some really uh, important uh, piece of work for 10 years only to have some, you know, mindless gentleman uh, uh, correct her or purport to correct her about some uh, and, and do so in a patronizing fashion. And I burst out laughing and I wrote to Mr. Jacobson uh, that he had earned himself a block with his, uh, um, uh, uh, with his. Uh, uh, I'm uh, waiting to see what you call it. The confidence, because I really of, his, the confidence of his ignorance, but that I was so amused by it that I was uh, going to uh, forbear. 
Um, and uh, so with that, we are not allowed to have fun anymore. And I don't think Paul Jacobson had a good day today because a lot of women chose this thread to share their mansplaining stories. Um, and um, uh, But we are allowed to have David Priest, um, who has never been known to mansplain. Uh, I know I'm with being overly philosophical today, but I'd like to ask, are you, is it mansplaining? if a man does it to another man? Is it just, is it? I think it's splaining. I, well, that's kind of my <laughs> point. You keep saying mansplaining. Yeah. Um, well, no, I didn't say just, he was. It's just Twitter. I didn't say he was mansplaining me. I said, I now know how women feel okay. when they are being mansplained within. I was identifying with my fellow man, which is to say my fellow woman. David. Welcome back to In Lieu of... The odd thing, Ben, the odd thing about this whole thing is when I was up at 3.55 this morning and I saw your tweet, I had the thought wrong that... What's wrong with you it, Jacobson? Are you just drinking too much that's coffee his, I, have, I have a newborn, so I have an excuse. Yeah, my schedule during the night is not my own. And I, I wonder if Mr. Jacobson, if that is the, um, the real name of said Twitterer, if he thought he was doing good because he was defending Quinta saying, well, she's not writing for Fred, she's writing for all of us and she is not Fred's servant. There may have been a motivation behind oh. it that was not solely about putting you down. Oh, I am certain he thought he was yeah. uh, uh, gallantly standing up for the, the poor defenseless Quinta Jurassic from her imperious yeah colleague who was uh, claiming that she had been traded from one male editor to another. Uh, in fact, um, Quinta, uh, but again, this is one of those situations where you really are at a disadvantage if you know not, neither of the parties involved True. rather than knowing well both parties involved. I had uh, asked Quinta to edit that piece and I'd asked her specifically whether she was comfortable with the inclusion of that specific anecdote. And she read those specific words and felt represented by it, um, uh, by them. And so, again, this is just one of those situations where you're a little bit hampered by being completely ignorant. Um, in talking to somebody who happens to know the subject in question. And it's all very unimportant, but it was 3.50 in the morning and I was um, uh, excessively amused by the whole thing. Uh, David, you have a new podcast. Uh, I do. And I want um, you to tell us about it. I, I can do that. The, the podcast playing off of the common term in intelligence is called Chatter, and it is a podcast in which the estimable Shane Harris or I, or in rare cases, both Shane Harris and I will have extended long-form conversations with really interesting people with a connection to national security, but people who either don't have as natural a connection to national security as you might think, or people who do, but we end up talking about something that is tangential to that core role in national security. So it's a different take on conversations about this stuff that most of us care about. And to date, we have had episodes with people like Adam Kinzinger, the representative from Illinois. We've had Sue Gordon, the former principal deputy director of national intelligence. Joe Weisberg, the creator of the Americans TV show. Uh, today, David McCloskey, the author of one of the best books of fiction I have ever read. He just wrote a spy novel called Damascus Station, which is brilliant in its realism in ways that most fiction never gets to. And it's just fun to listen to because you're, you're hearing people really get deep on something instead of giving a five to seven minute soundbite. How can people subscribe to Chatter? Well, there are many ways. <laughs> One way is to go to your podcast platform and search for Chatter by Lawfare. And you should find it, even though there's about 8,000 podcasts. I was just going to say, this derivative is... derivative of the word chat or chatter. This is really, that. Yeah, was... but it, 
Built there are a lot stage. of them, but ours is the best, so it's okay. Yeah. Um, another way you can do it is by going to Lawfare and clicking on one of the posts about an episode, and I then clicking a to Acast, which is our uh, podcast host, and you can click through there and find a way to subscribe from there. We are also on the Twitter. We are not on the Twitter at Chatter because that would have required like twelve years the of in the past. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Every derivative of chat or chatter is taken. So we took these tents. Whenever we post an episode, we will tweet it out and end it with and at that was chatter. So you can find us on Twitter at that was chatter. I like it because it has this implication that the, the po you know, the podcast is over now and you missed it. Well, the podcast episode is over because we posted it. Right. We're not going to go back and change All it. Right, so, so yeah, each week. The podcast is over. A few more really tough questions for the audience. Uh, 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 sorry, but for this audience, David, because we ask on In Lieu of Fun the yep. hard questions. I, know, I just I shared in the, uh, uh, in the in the chat, Tur, um, the link to Ooh. the Apple Podcasts menu where there is a uh, subscribe and also, you know, a... Uh, the ability to rate and review the podcast. Um, uh, mm -hmm. Do you have any any suggestions for what people, even mm. people who've never listened to the podcast, should do to help it get off the ground? You know, I think what one could do is is rate and review the podcast on any platform that you choose to, including uh, said Apple platform. Yeah. Uh, we appreciate any support, whether it's telling people about it, whether it's rating, reviewing, whether it's, uh, you know, writing fan mail, do you whether think, it's getting do you, Bloomberg to write an epic story about it, do you, anything. Do you think people should tweet the link that I just shared to the podcast? Can I, I think among the things people should do is tweet the link that you have yeah. shared. I, I, I think that it would be the right thing to do. And I'm, in fact, not doing so would be the wrong thing. And do you think we should cut this out because Kate is going insane? Uh, what? I'm not no, I think insane. we should continue it for the next 41 minutes because Kate is going insane. <laughs> I'm, I'm, ah, I've but took, your I've, shows you no, are. No, Teddy I, knows you're listening. I, uh, <laughs> um, you know, uh, apropos of nothing, one of my favorite uh, one of my favorite uh, sh movies is Arsenic and Old Lace with Cary Grant, in which there is a character who believes that he is Teddy Roosevelt. Um, ah. And he goes down yeah. to Much the lock. Like, uh, Night at the Museum. He goes down to Williams the... Uh, Williams, Teddy have Roosevelt. you guys never seen this movie? It's really good. Yeah. Well, anyways, he goes down to... These old ladies are, like, murdering a old, like, homeless guys... Uh, by feeding them like blackberry cordial with poison in it, arsenic in it. And then they're having their like kind of mentally unwell, uh, like grandson bury the bodies by telling him that he's digging locks for the Panama Canal in the basement. <laughs> and so anyways, I don't know why. I'm just like, I am in a weird mood because I have now spent four days of like 12 hours a day like painstakingly doing footnotes and formatting for an article that I mm -hmm. thought was going to like move from draft stage into almost done draft stage, like very quickly, like a couple of hours. Okay, is in law review I'm hell. In law review hell. So my brain is like not working. And also I'm sitting here feeling very anxious that I've like missed um, hanging indentation or something anyway sounds like you chose the wrong career man i you know <laughs> don't go I'll there tell you after please, because, don't t go there priest because like you oh. might just that might just be a triggering statement there and you might you know um, um i don't mind i do that. actually wonder why i have picked a career whether, <laughs> i told you whether I have an, no, 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 but like, I felt, feel, felt this way, like, ben, like, I felt this way, perhaps more so Ben knows for like the New Yorker article that I wrote, than I did like the amount of work that went into that article and the anxiety, like were just sky high. 
And I was like, yeah. so miserable. I was like, why do I do this for a living? <laughs> like, why do, and then like, so I don't feel, I think it's like all writing. It is an incredibly painful exercise. Not that Hertz well, letter. That I, Hertz letter came out like butter. But like the rest of it. Speaking I of writing. Advice for you. Tell me. But I can tell you from my experience, you can leave a career and just do something entirely new. This is this is really my probably my third time. So maybe I'm going to become maybe I'm going to become a, like a podcast host or like maybe a late night television right show on. host. Ben. I mean, you mm -hmm. know, we could start this show at four in the morning and the percentage of times <laughs> that we are up then uh, our, European, our European audience would love this. I yeah. Speaking of one of the most the best moments of productivity I've ever had was when I was in France for three months before the job market and like no one was on Twitter until like two in the afternoon. And like, yeah, it was it was awesome. I like it was very productive. Speaking of writing, David Priest, you have written a piece in Lawfare about the president's former president's intelligence briefings and some revelations that we've learned about Donald Trump. For those who have not read this piece, what'd you say? Yeah. What'd you say, David? I assume that everyone has read the piece and if they have not, then shame on Kate Klonick for not pushing it enough to her circles. That's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's true. Uh, yeah, it was interesting. Uh, but before we get to that piece, I forgot that in the chat earlier, there were several people in the chorus who were making comments about the fact that I never had hair. That, in fact, oh. I have always been this way. And while I would be proud to have always been this way, I have photographic proof that I recently discovered. Uh, this is David in high school. Why can't I see this right now? Right now, I cannot see this. His screen is a like a weird avatar. And like, I really think this is on purpose. Ben, you're muted. Ben, you're muted. Ben oh, is no. muted. And wait, David wait, wait. is a now, is David, a, is hold a it up rectangle. next to the your internet. face. Hold it up next to your I face, David. The internet. I don't think that this picture exists. I'll try to get the same size. I don't think it exists. One more time. Hang on. Can we're, you see we're, this? We're totally tweeting this. I can't see it. All right. Oh, no. It's done. I got it. I can't. I um, can't see it. All right. Hang on. Go to Twitter. Look at my Twitter this feed. This is so have inefficient. To, you have to get on the Twitter I'm at 3.50 a.m. I'm tweeting it right now. Um, I'm looking. I'm so sorry, world. I am so Dave, sorry. But yeah, it was high school, and I can't remember which year it was. Hair. Junior, senior year. But... I did have hair. It was receding, but I did have hair. I also had the 80s sunglasses and the 80s coat because that's what one Ruha did. How does Benjamin come Stead up decade. for me before Ben comes up for me on Twitter? Sorry, go ahead. You, you had an 80s coat? I, like, I am promised yeah, so much in this picture and it hasn't. <gasps> oh my goodness. <laughs> what is that? What are you What are you wearing? Is that hair? That, that's not that? an appropriate question, Kate. Wait, that's not on, this te is, on, this could on television. You just asked somebody, "What are you wearing?" No, how, you what is Rick Grinnell going to say? How does he? How? Sick. How do I know that's you? That could <laughs> literally be anyone. Really? Okay. Yeah. That's, that's, All right. Anyone so, with hair. I think more. So me, meanwhile, <laughs> meanwhile, David, uh, yeah. back on the yeah. high-minded subject of the president's yeah, article uh, intelligence somewhere. briefing. Okay. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Yeah. We're just you know, yeah. here for the so chatter. We had we had something interesting. We had something interesting happen lately, which is we had some reliable, credible information come out about the past president's intelligence briefings, and it was not it was not widely Good. disseminated. It was quietly dropped on the CIA website because it's part of a historical series they do, and it wasn't done for flash or publicity, but it gave us a whole lot more information than we'd had before about how Trump took or did not take intelligence briefings during the campaign, during the transition, and then during the presidency. So trust me, I've 
scoured this topic left and right. And we, as the general public, know a whole lot more now than we did hmm. just a few weeks ago. How did you right, find so out about that? How did I find they out about wrong. that? Because uh, some yeah. enterprising person on the Twitter had sent just a little thing saying something about, uh, I can't remember exactly what the tweet was, but it was before I had seen it on the CIA website because I don't spend my time perusing the That's public website. That's what I was basically wondering. And no, it, somebody tweeted it and said something like, oh, you know, John Helgerson has updated his history of intelligence briefings and included a link, but there wasn't much to the first tweet that I saw. And then I realized two things. First of all, you know, I'm the guy who writes about this stuff, so I probably should see what's new. And number two, I was teaching weekly graduate seminar at uh, George Mason on intelligence and the presidency a few days later, and we were slated to talk about Donald Trump and intelligence. And this could not be a, get, a better gift for a seminar leader to have this raw material that I could push to the students. So, so I perused it. It was maybe cool. 30, 40 pages, and it had a whole bunch of detail um, from a pretty reliable source. It's not an official CIA history. It is the, the book um, written by John Helgerson at the behest of CIA's in-house kind of research center. Um, and it's blessed by CIA because it's published on the CIA site and government printing office site only. But it's about as good as it gets. His previous work has really checked out from my own research, and he has access to classified files that I don't. So it's pretty rich source of material. Hmm. All right. And and how would you characterize what it says? Yeah, it. there's something to please almost everybody here because the people said that Trump never took intelligence seriously. There are examples from some of his briefings of him engaging, asking questions, trying to get material. And it, it shows him being more engaged than I think some people believed. Hmm. Overwhelmingly, however, it paints a picture of somebody who was easily distracted, who didn't play along the way intelligence briefings usually get, which is you listen, you try to determine what the, the closest thing to the truth you can is, and then you use that to make policy. Uh, that's largely absent from the new material. It's much more that he was interested in hearing his own opinions expressed and challenging that he disagreed with, not in order to get to closer to the truth, uh, but in order to show that he was right. Um, it also had a couple of real revelations. It indicated that Donald Trump did not get a briefing of his president's daily brief for about the last month of his presidency at all, that he just stopped getting them after he left for Mar-a-Lago in late December of last year. And that at the beginning of his presidency, unlike most presidents elect, he did not get a briefing on the covert actions of the United States of America that were authorized by the, the incumbent president. And that's weird because contrary Why? to popular terminology, they are not the CIA's covert actions. They are the president's covert actions executed by the CIA. And on January 20th, they were Donald Trump's covert actions, but he did not take a briefing on those covert actions, not only before January 20th, but for several weeks after becoming president he literally did not know what his own covert actions were. That yeah, was a bit of a surprise. That's not great. No, I think that's that's a good summary. Um, <laughs> the author titled the chapter like a unique challenge, but I think he could have also titled it. That's not that's great. That's not great. <laughs> yeah. So I am curious what you found um, most surprising and interesting in this. I mean, on the one hand, you know, the stuff about Trump not bothering to get it at all and wanting to hear yep. his own opinions is really a dog bites man story relative mm -hmm. to expectations. On the other hand, yep. it's kind of objectively, as you guys just said, not great. Um, and it's kind of important. On the other hand, the yep. president's, uh, former president's, uh, actual the fact that he was often doing it you know doing a better job uh more engaged with the briefings than the common mythology had it is quite surprising uh at least to people like us on the other hand you know uh saying president does minimum to do job um <laughs> is like 
I, like actually it's burned, it, Ben. Yeah, I mean, it's like it's like saying, yeah. "Wow, you know, Kate Klonick actually, you know, showed up and taught her classes." And you wouldn't like, like, like no one would say, "Wow, wow, right?" That's no. really, you know, they I would, would say, "Drag them on Twitter if they said that about me." <laughs> so like, it's so, too bad he doesn't have that avenue anymore. Yeah. How did that happen? <laughs> so, um, uh, what what do yeah. you think? Like, what's from your analytic perspective? What's the what's the yeah. real news here? Let me let me hit you. Other than the things I've just um, mentioned, let me hit you with. Off the top of my head, I can think of four, and I'll hit them quickly. Uh, number one, the fact that this was published and put out there on the website, it, it wasn't really a surprise to me because it fits the pattern, but because of the way it portrays Trump, probably in a what is a more neutral perspective than most people expected, but it still comes across as very negative, uh, probably more so than any president since Nixon in previous editions of this book. It's a bit surprising. Uh, the first edition came out in 1996 and talked about all of the presidents up to Clinton. Um, then it was updated in, I believe, 2012, the first time, and it included up to the election of 2004, the previous president. It was updated two years ago to update up to 2012. And then it was updated now and released, what, several months after the previous administration ended. So the, the first point is really the fact that, although it seems like this is really quick to get a intelligence blessed history of the Trump briefings out, it is fitting the pattern of the last few presidents who have left office where hmm. John Hogerson would update his book within months of the end of the, the, the presidency itself. So that's one. Number two, we've had a lot of reporting, as you said, about what happened in Trump's intelligence briefing. Hmm. Overwhelmingly for the past four years, it was about, you know, anonymous source reveals this, or a source familiar with the briefings reveals this. And you and I know that a lot of these sources are fantastic sources. The, the reporters and the editors take them seriously. But as reader, you don't know where that's coming from and how much weight to put on it other than the credibility of the reporter and the outlet. Well, this often comes directly from the briefer themselves. A lot of the quotes in this new material are from Trump's daily intelligence briefers, uh, or their memos from the CIA about what happened in those briefings. So it's more credible than a lot of earlier information. It confirms a lot of what we know uh, or what we thought we knew from reporting. Uh, third, there's some interesting stuff in here about Mike Pence. You might remember him. He was vice president for a while, but largely like laid guy. low and didn't do much, right? Until January 6th, he really didn't do much. Well, we know Did now he why, because he was spending January his time. 6th? What's that? What did he do after January 6th? Um, he certified the election. Oh, there was you know, that. He okay. did his, it's kind of like you teaching a class. He did his fundamental duty. So we give him credit for that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but I don't give him credit that, for that. <laughs> it, it turns out he was actually taking intelligence really seriously. And there's information in here about him taking briefings every day of the week, even when his son's wedding was on and welcoming his briefers back, all of them at the end of the term and giving them awards for their briefings. And it presents Mike, Mike Pence in a very serious, studious customer of intelligence light. Uh, I'm not too surprised by this because vice presidents ever since Walter Mondale have been pretty studious customers of the president's daily brief, have taken it often in part because vice presidents don't have much to do. So I don't think it's that much of a surprise, but it still was interesting to see that confirmed because during the Trump administration, you almost never had reporting on Mike Pence and his national security role. It was a black hole for us who studied it. And then hmm. finally, on the more disturbing side was Mike Flynn. Mike Flynn gets some attention here. Uh, you might remember him because he was the national security advisor for about two Scaramucci's before losing his marbles. And he actually got covert action brief. I see what you did there. That was with pretty, the that was pretty good, Scaramucci. actually. I liked that. Oh, really? Because those words just came from magic. I don't know. Yeah. Thank you. Like butter. So Mike Flynn got a covert action briefing on December 7th of 2016. So about a month after the election, he gets the full briefing along with uh, Mike Pence of all the covert action. The president doesn't take one, but Mike Flynn has it. And then Mike Flynn takes lots of intelligence briefings. So he's getting loaded up with all of this top secret information uh, while he's, you know, playing with foreign governments and ultimately 
going out there and talking about crazy QAnon things. Um, it, it basically makes you a little more worried about unconfirmed positions because the National Security Advisor, of course, unlike Secretaries of State, Defense, Attorneys General and such, uh, National Security Advisor is not confirmed by the Senate. So a president can put anyone in there, even Mike Pence. Um, I'm sorry, Mike Flynn. <laughs> Super interesting. All right. So before we go to audience questions, I have one question and um, and I and Kate has however many she has. My question is, does this story in the aggregate make you more scared, less scared or not change your level of scared? of the idea of Donald Trump coming back into power as president again? Uh, slightly more scared, but only slightly. Why? Uh, because I think he, well, I don't, I can't say, a, I think I know what he thinks. I can't get in that mental space. But it is reasonable to think that someone who has left the presidency and has had time to reflect on all of the top secret information and super secret stuff that he could have spent more time with and could use to his personal advantage, um, it's hard for me to think that it wouldn't be worse the second time than the first. But I already felt that to a large degree, so that's why it's only slightly worse. Man. Okay. okay. I'm like not, I'm, I'm absolutely not going to do the emotional and mental work to prepare myself for a Trump presidency. Like, why would I do that? Like, I will do that when the day comes and I have to do it just like I did the first time. And it was terrible. I don't like, I wouldn't, I'm not like happier. Like, I don't think I would have been any happier if I'd spent the three months previous freaking out about Donald Trump being president and Hillary losing than if I was like, hidden under a rock and then came to that realization on like the day after election day. It was terrible. With one exception, I, mean, like, I agree with you. Yeah. yeah. The exception is if, and maybe the, the word is worrying that we're, we're centered in on here, but um, if, if you ignore something, and I don't think you're saying that, I don't think you're saying you just want to pretend it doesn't exist, but, but if you go to that extreme away from worrying about it, which is, you know, I'm not going to think about it at all that removes any impetus for action and yes. do the things necessary to prevent the outcome that you don't want. So there is there is a healthy level of worry to the extent that it motivates one to to take action, which in our system we still have the ability to do. Um, so I always advocate people to, yes, be worried, be concerned to a healthy extent that motivates you to to express yourself and do what you need to do to prevent the outcome that you least desire. Well said. All right, we are going to go to the audience. Put your questions in the ask a question box. If you are, look, at right now we've got Richard Wattenbarger, Christopher Argerus, and the very reverend Hillary Doctor, uh, Dr. Hillary Livingston, all three of them, long time in lieu of fun, show your face on the screen kind of people. If you are one of those people who we've never seen your face, who doesn't show up regularly to ask your question. I just want you to ask yourself, what would this guy do if he had a question on in lieu of fun? And the answer to that question is, <laughs> shoe bills actually can't say anything. They can merely rattle their beaks together uh, really fast in a fashion that sounds like a machine gun. And he would not give a shit. If, Which uh, was also my style of briefing back in the day. That's right. It was, you know, that's why they yeah. called you machine gun priest. Richard Wattenbarger, the floor is yours. Hello. Um, so I have, I have two questions. I'm going to pose them in order of increasing importance. Um, and so the first one is uh, you mentioned that the president does get his intelligence from other sources than the PDB. And uh, so uh, if that's the case, why should we be concerned about his relative neglect of the PDB towards the end of, of his term, um, yeah. except that it is beyond just a general neglect of the, the you know, his general lack of discipline? Yeah, um, I can I can handle that one. The 
concern is twofold. First of all, the president's daily brief itself for roughly six years now is the most coordinated intelligence in terms of all the things that can to the agent and security matters. The PD has the most review oversight with issues of uncertainty and sometimes there's been has the best chance of the, the intelligence community the best come from Dave, multiple David, David, you're views. breaking up. So. Um, can you uh, refresh your screen or turn off your video? All right, try now. Uh, David, How's it coming can through you? Now? Yeah, you're you're sounding much better. Start the answer over again, okay. please. We'll give it a nine stay. No, no, it's yes. bad again. Hmm. Do you want to just do these answers in charades? I can't see him either. Yeah, that's what twist. You know. I'll, Mere I'm mortals do charades with themselves visible. I was just going to try to like, turn, well, okay. Is David, okay. can you hear me now? I am now? off of video. Can you hear me now? Yes. Very yes. Well. Excellent. Okay. Uh, I will give shorter answers because they're even, even easier to sharpen without video. So I, the PDB is the pinnacle of intelligence coordination and you get a better product from your intelligence if it is something that a lot of people have eyes on. And the president not getting the president's daily brief means that he relies on national security information that is less vetted and less coordinated. So that's the, the first reason. The second reason is that if there is not intelligence information getting to the president through the PDB, then it has to come to him through one of several other channels. Most of them revolve around the National Security Advisor. In the Trump administration, some National Security Advisors were simply not very good at making sure information got to the president otherwise. And if the president is not somebody who is seeking objective information from the National Security Advisor or the Situation Room, then the lack of a PDB really matters because those backup mechanisms simply aren't working. Okay. Your second question, yeah, and, and this, Herr this Dr. Is, Professor Bruckner. <laughs> this is of the, of the utmost importance and gravity. Um, so since you're a student of the presidency, and, and one of the things that I've noticed is, you know, the last elections in which we had two bald major party candidates were in 1952 and 1956, before most of this audience was even born. And so um, my question is, what does this indicate? Does this indicate a deeper malady within the body politic for which we are now paying? And how should we address this? I'm going to try to come back on video for this. Tell me if it works or not. Mezzo, mezzo, but it is important that you be on video for this part. I figured the visual matters here. So... I will challenge the premise of your question, Richard, because we do know that in the modern presidencies, um, Dwight Eisenhower and uh, Adlai Stevenson were the, the, the last two bald candidates together. But back way back in the presidency, when you had people wearing wigs all the time, we don't really know what hair was going on under Washington and Adams and Madison and Monroe and the rest. I just want to say about that, that, um, uh, you Bring know, back wigs? No, the wigs? I, like I the think wig you're, party? you're skipping, yeah. David yeah. A, like a, and Kate, a really important part of history. Kate is not skipping it. David is. It's the part with the incredible mutton chop sideburns. Um, Martin Van Buren, Martin Chester Van Buren. Arthur. They had yeah, some the, crazy hair and sideburns, th respectively. This is, uh, you I know. I feel like that's the Jack Dorsey of today, like maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's right. 
Um, but meanwhile, back on the part of the planet where we think about actual issues, there's Christopher Argerus, uh, who has no time for mutton chops sideburns. He's got actual questions. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I can ask yes. both of them because the, the first one he might have sort of partially answered, but maybe he doesn't want to say anything more. So the first question was um, the fact uh, that we talked about uh, uh, President Trump didn't take uh, uh, briefings on the covert action um, that was available to him exclusively as president. Um, only he could o order those. Does, does that suggest that he didn't understand the, the unique uh, capabilities and responsibilities that he had as president, or he just didn't care? Wow, that's a tough one. Um, again, I don't know what's in his head, but it seems to me that <laughs> Trump didn't know what he didn't know. <laughs> and he he probably didn't know what he was missing and he probably didn't care. You know and what I was thinking me, that's just disturbing. now, David, what? is like how presidential what? you look. It's like true. I get that a lot. Yeah. 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 Like I think that I that's, that a lot. yeah. Oh my God, that's amazing. Do you know it's almost like 12 months, a, a year to the day that you and Mike Chase came on as part of the three wise the men. The wise men episode, yeah. That was a good episode. Yes. That was yeah, a good episode. I felt episode. very wise that day. Yeah. Christopher, yeah, your second special. question. Um, okay. Uh, note, note everybody how I'm like, like keeping very, this on substance today while you yeah, you're are, really like, David's putting on wigs and, and I'm making sure that the, the people who have substantive questions get to ask them. And that is Shubil Energy. Right there, Christopher. So, so we we heard a lot uh, about uh, Trump's former national security guys or people saying people. Sorry, not guys. People saying, uh, well, you should have seen all all of the, if you, only you had known all the things that we prevented him from doing. One of the most egregious things I think that they didn't prevent him from doing was uh, allowing him to tweet apparently a, 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 an image from one of his PDBs about a sensitive right. I Iranian uh, missile site. So could you sort of explain the levels of breakdown uh, that would allow an image from a PDB to end up in a presidential tweet beyond just, oh, yeah. they let him do any, anything he wants to do. He's a spoiled child. I think I'm going to surprise you here with where I go. The level of breakdown was completely with the American people because the president in our system has the ability and the discretion to declassify anything at will. The president is the prime classification authority and therefore is the prime declassification authority. If the president wants to send the PDB to Vladimir Putin every day as it's written, the president can do that. The National Security Advisor does not have the duty to stop him. I think a reasonable National Security Advisor would try to and would resign, but they do not have the authority to stop him because we don't elect a National Security Advisor. We elect a president to be commander in chief to respectfully manage things like national security. So therefore, the problem with the president taking a picture of the PDB and tweeting it out if he chooses to is solely on the American people for electing somebody of such a character that they would do that. All right. Um, David, we have two more questions and then we are gonna do a really important exercise of choosing the next uh, shirts for the clothing monster Ooh. order. Um, uh, and <laughs> Kate's like, no, I was That's not consulted on That's your personal choice, man. Um, I don't know. I, oh my I mean, gosh, I love I love the background, Hillary. It looks so thank great. you. I love it. Do you like my gnome that is that his nose lights up? I love well, it. We got we got see. Oh yes, I love all of it. This is amazing. Super oh awesome. Uh, thank you. I'm like in the mood just the to see it. That's great. Thank you. Very. I like to be festive this time of year. So. Please keep it up year round. There we go. I could, I could do that. Um, so thanks for having me on. Um, thanks for coming on, David. It's always interesting to hear your um, commentary and thoughts on things. 
Um, my question is more about um, what inspired you to get involved in government service, national security issues, and what's the biggest thing you've learned from your career experience? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I got involved in national security and joined the CIA because it was the best job offer coming out of graduate school. Um, I had decided at the time I didn't want to teach, even though I have gone back and taught at other times and enjoyed it immensely. But at the time, I wanted to get in and do some service. And rather than join the military, I thought joining the CIA was the, the thing to do. And I, I can't speak highly enough about taking that step. I think it was uh, the right step at the right time for me, but also the right step for almost anybody who even considers it. Um, so yeah, and probably what I learned the most from that, if I can broaden out your question, my experience from it was the stereotypes in Hollywood movies and in the media, uh, kind of about uh, national security bureaucracies are horrible places filled with horrible people. Uh, don't get me wrong, there are horrible people. Uh, I worked with the guy who was you know, drugging women and uh, assaulting them and things like that while a government employee in Algeria, um, right? He was one of them. There turns out there were a couple, but that was the one I was referring to. And um, there are bad people who get through even the security processing and all of that. But overall, you've got a bunch of people who are taking jobs that are less than they could get in the private sector because they actually care about serving their country and serving the national security of the United States. And I can't emphasize enough that that is the vast majority of people who work in these bureaucracies that you just don't hear about. All right, Paula, you get uh, what may be the last question or may not be. Um, do I ask both of, of them or just one yeah, of them? I think you get to seize control and see how long you can keep David Priest talking. Okay, perfect. Um, so my first serious question is, how do um, people who seem sane get into government? I think we're talking like executive branch stuff and then make their way to the top like Michael Flynn and then turn out to be like full wacko. Um, and then I saw yesterday, I think it was on like RT News, um, a retired army colonel going on and saying like very like absurd things about whether or not Russia should invade parts of Ukraine. Um, and then my second question is, would you wear a dog shirt? Um, and if you would, is this kind of a CIA, FBI rivalry thing? Because Peter will not wear a dog shirt. I'm going to leave you up there because I suspect there are going to be important follow-up questions on the dog shirt front. David, um, how do nutcases get yeah. in and and should would it be controlled if we just had Michael Flynn wearing dog shirts? <laughs> um, I guess I would ask in return, what percentage of the population do you think are in you know your term nut cases? Um, I would I would argue from experience that the percentage of the people who go off the deep end, uh, whether it's politically, or uh, psychologically, which ob obviously the latter is much more concerning and we should have compassion. But on the political side, the percentage is much, much smaller within the national security bureaucracies. Um, I don't know how to include the military in that because it's a different training and recruitment system. Um, the point with Mike Flynn, I think, is the point that's true for many people, which is the old theory is you get promoted to the level of your own incompetence. and. You do a job well, you get promoted to the next level. Even if your skills are best suited for managing at that level you are at, you tend to get promoted if you're doing well. And within the military, that's definitely the case. You do well at a certain level, you get promoted. And Mike Flynn, by many accounts, was a very good mid-level officer who did very well on some, some matters that he was focused on. But when he gets to a matter, uh, a position of executive authority, like running the DIA, um, it clearly comes out that he is not suited for executive management. So I think it's a flaw in, inherent in a lot of bureaucracies, not just national security. Of course, the stakes matter more in national security. So you really wish that you had senior officers paying more attention to that and screening people even more delicately as they get up. But that did not happen. Um, the dog shirt. 
I would happily do anything that Pete Strzok does not do, and I would not do anything that Pete Strzok does do simply to exacerbate the CIA-FBI feud in our mutual retirements. I think that is a noble cause. And yes, of course, I would wear a dog shirt if for no other reason than to, quote, rub Pete's nose in I, it. I have a follow-up question on that. There is a very specific... I knew that was going to happen. Um, it has butterflies on it. And it has more than one dog. I think it has like six or seven dogs on it. Puppies Would you with butterflies. Paula has a specific, specific shirt. Mm. I do. Yeah, that's not a solo dog shirt. That's <laughs> odd. Um, my only dog apparatus that I have in my repertoire um, is I collect crazy socks. Uh, I do not do the shirts as Ben does, but when doing events before the before, um, I would always wear different socks. So at an event, you know, I would wear the, the rare presidential socks or the alien socks. And and often I would wear some odd dog I think socks. socks and are a that, gateway that's my thing. drug to dog shirts. I think that like if you're exercising your sartorial weirdness in socks, that it is yeah. only a matter of time until you are wearing a dog shirt underneath your button oh, down. Kate, can I, can like, I tell you a brief story about sartorial yeah. weirdness? I got, I, got the, I got the story for you, and I will not use names to protect the guilty. But I was doing a training course where I was leading some officers from across the intelligence community on a, a classified training thing. And one of the people in the class was a National Security Agency officer, uh, NSA. And one of the students in class noticed that he was wearing two very bright, but very differently colored socks and pointed this out to everyone in the class saying, look at John here. He's wearing two very different socks. And somebody said, John, why, you know, why did you do that? Did you make a mistake this morning? And he said, no. And then his face got very serious as if he was on camera making a, a, an actual statement. And he said, no, I do that on purpose because that's my way of sticking it to the man. Wow. That's, that's, that's it right there. All right. So yes or no, if Paula that. sent you a, uh, a multi puppy with butterfly and rainbows shirt, would you wear it on the show? And I just want to say just this is not a hypothetical because Paula has sent me such a shirt. Wait, wait, wait. If if this is you sending me the shirt or this no, is Paula, Paula sending me the shirt? Paula has been known on at least one occasion. I cannot, I, I do not know for sure that there are not more such occasions to anonymously send uh, people Dog shirts. Uh, this particular multiple puppies with a rainbow and butterfly and Songbirds shirt it and was, expect them to wear it on live television. I think and so we the, should clarify to the world <laughs> that I got the address legally from the owner of the house and it was not anonymous. I think you just happened to miss my name. <laughs> um, uh, there was no card in it. I had to go mm. on in lieu of fun and say, hey, uh, who sent yeah, I this? I do remember being. I do this remember highly being bizarre being like, shirt. Did you send this to me? And I was like, so I get, it, I get. By the way, like well, multiple just make texts this clear. like this, like a month. But, but I just want to clarify with you, David, that your position is you would wear yep. such a shirt if Pete Struck would refuse. Um, yes, if you were to send me said shirt, I would not wear it. If Pete were to wear <gasps> such shirt. I probably would not wear it. If Paula were to send me such shirt before sending Pete said shirt, I would wear it with glee. How can we turn this into money? So uh, Pete has just texted me, typical agency, probably while sipping a stiff peppermint schnapps. Holy shit, Pete. <laughs> like. Oh, wow. I have not had schnapps since That's I was celebrating Pete's uh, departure yeah. from the FBI. Oh, All wow. right. We are no. going to leave it there. Oh, just kidding. David Pete. Priest, just you're kidding. a great American. Um, uh, even if your internet bandwidth it's sucks. Crappy. Um, uh, we are going to be back tomorrow. Um, 
uh, joined by Claire Berlinski from Paris, who is going oh. to um, uh, uh, talk about uh, her new uh, Substack project, uh, the, uh, the um, uh, 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 and um, I have never met her. I have been a fan for a long time, and uh, so I'm very excited about this. That will be 22 hours and 58 minutes from now. And I just want to say those 22 hours and 58 minutes from now, I intend to be asleep for as many of them as humanly possible. Yeah, you possible. must be tired. And it's until then, it. Mr. Priest. We're not allowed to have fun anymore. We don't have fun anymore. But? I have bobbleheads. And I have a shoe bill shirt. And Kate uh, actually does show up and, and teach her classes. 